Memorial Day weekend, the unofficial start of summer, is just a week away. And with driving costs at a six-year low, AAA says 55% of Americans are likely to take holiday road trips. Thanks to turn-by-turn -turn directions available on our smartphones, few travelers are likely to use paper maps to find their way. So have GPS and Google put traditional map bakers out of business? We sent Mark Albert to find out. Head south on old U.S. Highway 2. Hit the road, Jack. Don't you come back. It's time to hit the road for summer with a full tank of gas, a sense of adventure, and the now ubiquitous GPS. Head south on old U.S. Highway 2. So if everyone has digital directions on their dashboard, who still needs a paper map? There's a map of the world on the wall. It's been a rough ride for handheld maps. Rand McNally started making driver's atlases in 1924. Nearly a century later, it's mainly gone digital. Tom Tom shifted into high gear with GPS mapping, only to get passed by free Google mapping services on cell phones. Uh, so this is a relief model of the Yosemite Valley in California. You can't get this on Google Maps, can you? Uh, not yet. Daniel Huffman now, is a cartographer who lectures at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, considered by many to be the cradle of academic map making in the United States. Does anyone use a paper map anymore? Oh, certainly. There's a swing back, I think, to paper mapping. If cartography was supposed to be on the road to extinction, then a lot of people here got lost. Our students don't sit around in the market very long. They tend to get snapped up. I'd say that cartography is stronger than it's been in a long time, job placement wise. In just five years, the number of students in the program has doubled to 160. And in the fall, the university is launching an online master's program for the first time. There are 30 slots. Nearly 60 have applied. You're saying there's a waiting list? Uh, yes. There's a waiting list to get into Introductory Cartography, cartography 101. Uh, yeah, Geography 370, but yes, <laughs> Intro Cartography. The demand is being driven by those who need a growing number of specialty maps for disasters, yeah. relief work, so search and rescue, military, and topography. Uh, so here. Like this one Huffman made of his native Michigan. Drumlin are these sort of uh, long, thin, kind of teardrop shapes that are left over by glaciers. Cartography has also plotted its own route into the future, and that future is data mapping, like these maps created by students, illustrating how schools in sunnier states generally lead to more sports championships, and which farmers markets are most accessible to low-income families. It's a wild west right now, and our students and the, and the instructors here are paving the way in terms of learning and teaching these new technologies. It is the largest map collection in the world. Um, John Hessler is a curator of the Library of Congress's 5.5 million maps. They fill a room two and a half football fields long under Independence Avenue in Washington, including in a secure climate controlled vault. This is the oldest um, map in the collections of the Library of Congress. But Hessler isn't just living seven centuries in the past. He's on board with change so fast, it'll make your globe spin. Like the increasing trend of using motion in maps to plot wind patterns in North America, for example, or the ongoing Syrian refugee crisis. Today with modern mapping, what we're looking at is all sorts of data being spatialized. Cartography now is really about those sort of temporal complex visualizations. Somebody told me recently that spatial is sexy again. Spatial is sexy again. Motion through space is the holy grail of cartography. George um, Washington drew this map. George Washington drew this map. This is, but Hessler this, isn't this. getting rid of these vintage works. It will allow people in the future to look back on how we perceived ourselves. And neither is Roger Cohen. So these are the maps of your lives. <laughs> Of my life, at least, yeah. yeah. It's true, lives is probably better because I've lived in, I don't know how many different countries. So. The New York Times columnist wrote recently about his initial decision to throw away the maps he's collected through three decades as a foreign correspondent and editor. This map of Yugoslavia and, um, of course, the country doesn't exist anymore. You can't buy this map anymore. No, it's gone. It's maps of countries that don't exist anymore aren't worth much. But for Cohen, he realized they were too valuable to toss. And I thought, what do I need these for? You go to a new country and you just look at your smartphone. Um, and I felt this tightening of my stomach and this 
emotional reaction um, and a feeling that it was something, these maps, were things that I didn't want to dispose of. A lot of people, when they hear a specific song, the memories flood back and it right. takes them back to a specific time. Yeah. Are maps like that for you? Yeah, very much so. Uh, I was looking at maps of Italy, I was a correspondent in Italy, suddenly I was back in Sicily, I was in France uh, where I once owned a house and back in that house then thinking of a particular camembert cheese I'd eaten at a certain point. But maps are pleasurable. Uh, a GPS is not pleasurable. So you have a love affair with maps? I guess I do. <laughs> a love affair that for many has not yet come to the end of the road. For CBS This Morning Saturday, Mark Albert on a road trip somewhere in Nevada.